For this week's learning unit, you're just assigned to one chapter in the Phyllis Day and Jerome Shield text. This is uh, the chapter that covers the early years from America, for America rather, in the first half of the 1800s, really from the Revolutionary War time or shortly thereafter, up until the Civil War or a few years before then. I have uh, divided this week's lecture into two parts just uh, for the sake of having a couple shorter lectures for you. So those of you that uh, feel a little overactive perhaps, uh, you, you know, you're, you won't have to sit quite as long at least, but you'll have to sit twice. Um, just a reminder to you that uh, you uh, should be reading or getting ready to read uh, Upton Sinclair's book The Jungle. That uh, paper is due in uh, two weeks from now. That's in week six. And so uh, I encourage you to be reading that if you haven't already. The instructions for the for the paper are in your syllabus and on the syllabus page in, in Blackboard, so please read that. I think they're pretty self-explanatory, but I will just tell you briefly what I'm looking for here is not is not a book report necessarily, but really what I'm looking for is is as much uh, a reaction paper as anything else. And so a good paper, and I think this is only three to six pages long, so we're not talking about a major work of art here or anything. Um, we'll have a brief summary of the book, your reaction to some of the major themes in the book or how the, the book went or what your thoughts are about what the book tells you. And, and if at all possible, tie it into some of the course concepts that you're learning during the course of the semester in, uh, so far in this, in this work. The, the week that uh, you will present your paper is the week that we'll be going over the progressive era in American history, which is the time period that the jungle covers, or that book covers, or whatever. So the, it should blend pretty well with your readings uh, in the day text at the same time. I have been asked, by the way, about whether or not the edition that I have listed in the syllabus is the one that you have to get in and certainly not any edition of this text or this book the jungle will do it's it's a it's a classic and it's really i think uh, i'm not sure what the term is for it now but it's sort of out there sort of an as a common product now or whatever so that uh, you can find free downloads of this book in many different locations i know that kindle has free downloads the only thing i i encourage you to do is to make sure you get the unabridged version that is the full version of the book and and don't get a shortcut book so this week day takes a look at social welfare and the federal government as she as she opens this chapter and uh, set, kind of sets the stage for for a discussion about how the federal government related to social welfare during the first half of the 1800s in in America one of the things that's mentioned, and, and this is something that uh, conservative Americans will tell you now, those who are opposed to entitlement programs, as they're called now, the public assistance programs, um, uh, will tell you that they believe that the, the Constitution does not have a provision for the federal government to be involved in social welfare whatsoever. And the way the Constitution is written, therefore, that if, if there is nothing saying it's the federal um, responsibility or authority, then the the um, responsibility or the authority falls automatically to the states. So if it isn't spelled out in the Constitution as a federal responsibility, then it's a state responsibility. And many people, many thinkers believe, the conservative thinkers at least believe that there's no mention of social welfare programs in the Constitution, so therefore it should be a state concern and not a federal concern and that's used as an excuse basically to you know justify the keeping the federal government out of social welfare needs however it, it can be pointed out i think pretty pretty well that the preamble of the constitution speaks to the the union being formed uh, to among other things promote the general welfare and that certainly to me should include social welfare and uh, entitlement programs so I think that whether or not that it is a part of the Constitution is something that could be debated. But as early as 1792, Thomas Paine, who was a writer back in the, the the early years of the well, I think during the Revolution and also during the early years of the of the Republic, was writing that uh, poverty was related to the fault of the economic system. Paine recognized that uh, it wasn't uh, that there were there were issues with the way the system was set up already that was going to create poverty, and he encouraged abandoning the philosophy that a poor law philosophy which really kind of talks about individual blame for, for poverty and establishing a system that would include pensions uh, set by the federal government, family allowances, subsidizing public education and guaranteed employment. You notice the subsidized education there um, 
there was no public education system set up in those days at all and so only people who belonged to the wealthy were going to were going to have their children educated and and so it really was kind of setting up a separation of the classes and so Payne wanted to see to it that the government really did step in so that uh, everybody had access to things like education and employment But as I said, it, uh, because of the way the Constitution is written, the provision of social welfare for the needy remained in the domain of the individual states. At least that was the philosophy in that era. The poor law philosophy was the dominant uh, foundation for any thinking about poverty and addressing the needs of poverty. And so um, any government intervention would, in charity programs would be very reluctant and, and uh, at, at best reluctant. And, and so if there was charity to be Take, uh, to be given or to be pursued, it was going to be done by private uh, charitable organizations. Now, some people didn't really think about that being the case, and one person you may remember from your American history uh, lessons, you know, in the early 1800s, Dorothea Dix, who campaigned or who, um, you know, agitated for the uh, provision of um, better conditions of improving conditions for the mentally ill in America in the United States and and because of uh, largely because of her her uh, campaigning and pressure or whatever Congress came to pass uh, the 10 million acre act acre act in the early 1800s that that uh, set up federal lands that were devoted to the indigent mentally ill those mentally ill people who had no means to take care of themselves or to seek treatment uh, and there was some other, I think another two and a half million acres set aside for, for the deaf and the mute. So this 10 million acre act essentially established federal lands and the proceeds from those lands, whether it be the sale of the lands or the development of the lands, would be used to, um, to fund programs for the mentally ill under this act. Um, Franklin Pierce, who was the president uh, at the time, vetoed that bill in 1854, and, and he did that because he was concerned that uh, it would lead to the federal care of all indigents, and he didn't believe it was a, it was the place of the federal government to do that. And so, um, so the efforts of Miss Dix were were um, really kind of torn asunder by by the president's veto of that of that bill. Uh, Franklin Pierce uh, was a uh, a president who was elected from the state of Vermont, as I recall, and you'll remember from uh, earlier week's uh, lectures about the fact that, you know, the New England states were really set up uh, on the notion of hard work and, you know, religiosity and those kinds of things, and so um, the, the New England states weren't really inclined towards uh, you know, being very favorable to, to um, providing uh, state assistance for, for the needy. So, so they believe really in taking care of yourself, and and uh, so so it's not too surprising that Pierce vetoed that act. But really, again, what he was saying is he drew, he drew the line there and said the federal government will not take care of indigents, will not take care of the mentally ill. Um, that's that's uh, that's a cause for the charitable organizations or for. Uh, local or state governments and so that's how things stood with almost all programs with one or two exceptions that's how it stood with almost all programs until the New Deal and the Franklin Roosevelt administration in the 1930s there's an article in this week's assignments it's a very short article from a back issue of Time magazine uh, entitled 1848 when America came of age and uh, I want you to read this article and do note, I believe that if it, at least if it comes up on your computer as it does in mine, there are two pages, so don't don't just read the page that first comes up on the screen, but but click on to the next page so that you read the full article. The article itself is not a very big article and it's more of an essay, but it's what is you'll find some striking things about that as it talks about what was going on in America during this period of time and what some of the themes were of thinking during this period of time and and you'll see that there's a real parallel a lot of a lot of correlation between then and now in the modern day and and uh, this this article I really kind of think kind of brings home that theme to you so there were there were uh, a number of social changes going on during this period of time politically and socially and economically and here um, here is a, a list of a few of them for one, uh, there were an increase in elderly population during this period of time, perhaps. You know, there were a couple of wars. I mean, of course, the, the Revolutionary War uh, and then the War of 1812 early in this period of time. And so the fact that there were not wars uh, perhaps helped uh, to allow some people to actually grow older, more people to grow older. Um, but also, I think the fact that the the nation was being established uh 
hospitals had were being established and you know there was some semblance of civilization here uh, I think probably enabled the lifespan of individuals to grow longer it, you know it wasn't that long ago in America and I think this would be a period of time where um, probably the average lifespan was into the mid 40s and so well our founding fathers all seem to be quite old when you look at pictures of them and things that are drawings I should say an artwork involving them um, it was really rare in those days for for men to grow to or women to grow to that age to be able to live to that age and so so as this era came along our lifespan was beginning to increase um, there was more urbanization and with that uh, an increase in the overall population you'll remember that we talked about uh, particularly in the middle Atlantic states how the immigrants and I think you'll find that a, a lot of the Im the immigration during this period of time a period of time really was through the middle Atlantic states New York and Philadelphia and, and to maybe perhaps Washington um, DC that uh, uh, the immigration there was a wave of immigration largely at this during this period of time from Ireland and Germany and uh, those individuals would of course most likely flock to the cities where there was thought to be work uh, with industrialization beginning to take hold later in this period of time in particular this, the uh, the urban centers became uh, you know the, sort of the the place to be but with all those workers there of course that meant lower wages if you remember from last week's or a week before perhaps a lecture earlier lecture where we talked about the fact that when you have available workers um, those who are unemployed that tends to keep wages down because employers can always find other people to fill jobs if you're not willing to work for low wages and so um, a lot of blame was actually put on the Irish and the Germans and the immigrants during this period of time for the fact that conditions were so poor um, there was a fair amount of unemployment during that period of time and so uh, there was really a lot of need social services needs during this era as well the Europeans also brought new political philosophies along with them which uh, to some extent was uh, disturbing to the colonies or not to the colonies rather but to the young nation and and um, uh, well there there was a lot of um, I believe uh, both for Irish and Germans during that period of time there was quite a bit of uh, misconceptions and stereotypes and um, uh, isolation uh, given to them because of because of all those concerns not at all unlike uh, what happens uh, with uh, with the Latino immigrants today you know there are a lot of concerns about limiting that and controlling it and a lot of uh, prejudices and uh, discrimination regarding those populations um, as in, as industrialization began to take hold um, work began to increase uh, away from the home as well the spinning jenny the uh, well the spinning jenny in, enabled yarn to be to be formed more uh, more readily and things like this but but that also led to manufacturing uh, clothing manufacturing and things like that um, as an industry and the, the cotton gin as well in the south was invented uh, I think during this period of time and so that enabled uh, cotton to be harvested more efficiently and and quickly and and uh, so cotton and and spinning jenny both kind of being available at that time led to an increase in uh, industrialization and a development of a garment industry um, in, uh, in the north this urbanization industrialization as I mentioned it led to gr uh, greater pockets of destitution and, and and a lot of high social needs those types of things and young women were beginning to take be taken away from families or moving away from families recruited to work in factories living in dorms those kinds of things and so the family system that we knew at the time of the formation of the country and, and during its agricultural years let's say really began to be torn apart during this period of time and in fact for those of you who um, have had other sociology classes or classes about uh, gender issues and things like this you might know that this is a period of time really where um, the separation of roles for men and women became more prominent so that uh, and largely while while young women were recruited to work in factory works 
by and large, men were the ones who were leaving home to work in, in the industries and factories that were available. They weren't, they weren't at home anymore, you know, on the farm or whatever, like we talked about uh, in an earlier lecture, but they were, or they were leaving the home to, to earn money and bring it and bring, bring home the bacon, so to speak, to the family. And, and the wives then were left behind to, to care for the children. And so this, these separate worlds of men having politics and work and, and those kinds of things in those, their domain and women being relegated to the home and to child rearing and things like that is their domain. This is kind of where this comes from. This, this, this isn't a, um, the, this separation of, of the genders in those domains isn't something that necessarily um, is a biological thing and that goes back eons at all. It really has to do with industrialization. While all this was going on in the north and the south, uh, social welfare programs as we talked about last week there really there weren't as many social welfare programs and there was quite a bit of toleration for just uh, you know uncomfortableness in the human condition um, there were no programs for slaves at all um, and if there were needs among poor whites uh, and and maybe some free blacks there there were some organizations some charitable organizations that might take care of them but it was expected more or less that the plantation owners the owners of the slaves would be the ones who would take care of their needs and it depended on what kind of owner you had. Some were better than others with their slaves. Many uh, neglected the needs of their slaves. Farm mechanization increases, becomes much more uh, farming, become more efficient, less need for human labor in some respects. Home manufacturing decreases during this period of time. So the economic economic market begins to absorb the services and produce to make the products essentially that were formerly performed at the home and so home life begins to change and this is this is the industrial revolution that we're talking about here in America with the industrial revolution not just the fact that there's more industry and that we have the steam engine and less less individuals needed to to complete a task um, but it also changed the structure of family life. It's, it changed the um, <clears throat> the ideas of men and women about what men and women do, and, and uh, many other things uh, were redefined because of this industrial revolution. And so that's why it is a social revolution, because it isn't just about the industry. It's about everything around it changing, just like... I will say again today with the, with the uh, microchip and how the uh, advent of the technology, the technological age and the information age, whatever you want to call it, the computer has changed life in in um, in all its levels and in all of its fabric. Life has changed for people because of the computers and will continue to change in all its facets. So again, a similar process going on in the early 1800s. Problems were developing during this period of time, that in, because of the fact that the family was kind of fractured during the, you know, at least during the day or during the week, because of the work environment, uh, more more uh, services were needed from outside the family now than before. Um, with with uh, increase in immigration, um, uh, the movement of individuals to urban centers, um, it it uh, unemployment went up, wages became. Um, were marginal at best for those who were working um, and there were different uh, a few different economic depressions during this period of time while the West um, was beginning to open up and by the West uh, well by the end of this period of time we were talking about California because I think the California gold rush was in 1849 um, and and there was an effort to lay the railroad track you know to the, so that uh, everybody could get to California basically um, the West in the early periods of time during this year really we were talking about Tennessee and perhaps Missouri and and Illinois and um, you know states Arkansas you know states in the middle what we would call the Middle West now or the South and uh, but as this era went along the West really became the true West and so the, that era was open for settlers but only some people you know a certain portion of people could afford to move there was a lot of hardship hardship and in, in getting across the country and it wasn't something you could just jump on a horse or hitch a rag a, a ride on a kind of so wagon you 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 had to have the resources to get there and it was tough um, tough that migration was very hard and again because in the west just like when the colonies were settled there wasn't any money out there a lot of the uh, settlements in the west established residency requirements from the very beginning for, for anyone needy that wasn't able to tend to themselves or had the means to support themselves
as, as the population in the east migrated from farms to cities, unemployment increased in the cities, uh, there were labor uprisings, which will oftentimes happen when there are too many people wanting jobs, wages are too low, insufficient employment available to them. Um, and because of the fact that the wages were so low and working conditions were really very poor, um, you began to see some of the early, early signs of labor unions organizing among labor workers. One of the faults that, of capitalism that is criticized by, this, by those who believe in the socialist system is, is that the workers really have no, no power in, in the system at all and that the management, um, without the intrusion of government or the intrusion of labor unions, management can do whatever they want to with their workers and the workers have no management or no control over that at all and so labor unions is one way you know the organizing the idea being uh, that the more workers that are organized and stand on one principle the more powerful they are with management um, this is where the early early phases of organizing begins in, in the labor movement and you can see the urban growth during this period of time was just was incredibly fast um, but <clears throat> this nation founded upon capitalism and that that pursuit of profit uh, you know that hands off laissez faire capitalism was the was the um was the trend of the day egalitarianism this notion of of everybody being equal some of which thomas paine wrote about and some of the early um founding fathers believed in you know uh, really was not the the primary theme but rather laissez faire capitalism was the driving force Now, as social needs developed, federal government, re, uh, re, um, you know, declined to participate in in um, provision of services and assistance for the needy, by and large. Um, it became necessary for charitable organizations to develop some by churches, others by uh, by private phil philanthropy, so to speak. Uh, and so a number of different organizations were were. Um, established basically to provide for for the needs of of um, destitute people the association for the improvement of the conditions of the poor that's the AICP was formed basically to begin to organize some of those charitable organizations maybe to cut out some of the duplication that was out there there may be maybe too many resources to one problem but not enough in another and so the AICPs were formed essentially to um, to help organize that and also to deal with issues about um, possibility of fraud, you know, people taking money that was donated and those kinds of things to provide some oversight, let's say. Uh, and one of the tools, let's say, that the AICP used that uh, uh, was to help the, the needy individual was referred to as friendly visitors. And um, these are the, the early, earliest uh, forebears, let's say, of the social workers today in the social work profession. And uh, although friendly visitors went about their work a lot differently than the social work professional does today, um, but the emphasis here, some some things in in uh, common that were in common, in fact, was the emphasis on casework. Um, this is um, casework really kind of focuses upon, as you remember from uh, a few weeks back, it, it focuses upon uh, an individual who uh, has a need uh, that needs to be fixed, sort of that medical model of doctor and patient, okay? And so so the friendly visitors had this emphasis on casework, which then would, of course, blame the individual situation on the individual. It, it, it believed an individual fault as the explanation for poverty. Um, and it de-emphasized almsgiving. So this was not, uh, this is not a profession that was going to go out and, and, you know, give people clothing and food and money or whatever that might be that that the need was you know the idea was to provide counseling to individuals um, and um, encouragement I suppose to to get up on their feet rather than give them things that would help uh, meet their needs um, the the, I, the AICPs um, kind of actually eventually develop into another type of organization that we'll be hearing about in another week or so called the Charity Organization Societies or COSs. Um, but, but through the 1870s, the AICPs and eventually the COSs uh, were, uh, began to collect social research data that, that really kind of laid the framework for the social work profession eventually. Now again, remember these are, these are privately funded charitable organizations, not government organizations. 
Phyllis Day spends some time talking about uh, uh, throughout this book. Uh, she'll each in each chapter pretty much she'll talk about the different populations that uh, are affected by social welfare needs in particular. And it's not to say that these populations and, and uh, you know racial or ethnic minorities in particular are the only populations that uh, you know that that uh, need assistance because that's certainly not the case. But but she does look at, at some of those populations that uh, you know well civil rights are themes that kind of go through this that have been kind of pushed to the side throughout American history. And she'll trace um, th both the availability or lack of availability of services as well as the progress, let's say, of these populations as we go from chapter to chapter. And so it, as you organize your thinking, one of the things you might do is begin to organize your thinking around this uh, this particular way of, of looking each chapter, you know, our special groups, so to speak, and what's going on with each group. And it will help you see some of the progress that uh, is made in America, or again, progress not made in America. And so the first group is that she looks at here, African Americans. and. Um, we, we often hear today uh, about complaints about affirmative action and affirmative action for uh, or is uh, efforts made by federal regulations generally federal regulations that require um, well the, the the belief is is that it that it says there's a quota this is what everybody thinks affirmative action means and so that say 40 percent of admissions to a university program have to be African Americans you know and that this is supposed to help African Americans catch up with the rest of the population in the world that's that's not what affirmative action is. Uh, the Supreme Court long ago has ruled that the quota system just in and of itself is is illegal and um, but um, there are other ways that affirmative action is applied whether it might be special recruitment efforts, uh, uh, special considerations given to ensure that individuals in certain populations get in for interviews, those kinds of things, but but uh, you, they can't hire somebody because somebody's black, uh, uh, you know, if it, it, unless, uh, you know, some like, you know, um, Native American organizations can uh, can hire have a, a preference for uh, hiring Native individuals, those kinds of things. But anything involving uh, with public funding, government funding, otherwise, you don't have specific hires based on race. Um, but but in any event, all that is to say that the basis for the need for affirmative action really kind of rests in the information you see in front of you here. Some of these things, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, there, there's a lot of a uh, lot of writing about slavery, the whole institution of slavery, and how it broke up the African American family and essentially uh, emasculated the the males in the family, um, and um, you know just essentially destroyed the, the the African American family because of the way that the slavery system was set up, and that generations later, uh, in in many ways. Um, the population continues to suffer from the ill effects of that generations before and and uh, don't think that that's not possible because it certainly is and so for instance in terms of education during this era African American children whether they were slave or free were denied education by law up until the 1830s so um, they couldn't even be educated formally and and uh, instead they were taught to cook clean wait tables do laundry those kinds of service organizations those kinds of uh, service duties rather that would would have them taking care of other populations of individuals and white kids were taught more things that where they could like farming and factory work and things where they could they could uh, make a living uh, and so this was a part of this a way that this population was conditioned into an ideology of inferiority. Later in the semester, I think you, we may be looking at a, um, um, I believe you'll be looking at a, uh, a video with Malcolm X in it talking uh, to a, a group of individuals in Harlem in the 1960s. And he he's saying um, that um, you still think of yourself as slaves. You still think of yourself as being a slave, and 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 uh, you don't understand that you know that you can stand on your own two feet, and that you can challenge the institutions now. That you don't have to do what you're told to do uh, by white people around you, and those kinds of things. And this is what he is talking about: this this ideology of inferiority that that reaches back into the days of slavery and into the early well before the early 1800s, certainly. 
1857, and here's another thing that you'll be uh, getting in this uh, course also is a we're going to we're going to touch on some major Supreme Court decisions over the last 150 200 years uh, as they have impacted civil rights largely and and and, um, and social welfare needs and so the first Supreme Court decision that we'll be uh, tracking is the um, the Dred Scott decision and uh, this was in 1857 and this was um, you know, uh, in during the Buchanan administration, before Abraham Lincoln was president, but Justice uh, Taney was uh, the was the the uh, um, chief justice at the time, and his court ruled. Um, well, the story goes with Dred Scott, and and this is partly myth that Dred Scott was a slave, and uh, he went north with I think from Kentucky, if I remember correctly, uh, went north into Illinois with his owner, and when and then in free territory or free state in Illinois, uh, left his owner, ran away more or less. And uh, when the owner tried to bring him back to Kentucky, you know, he maintained it because he was in a free state. He he was a free man. The slavery was illegal there. And uh, so he sued for his freedom, essentially, or the owner sued to get him back. And uh, the, the long story short is um, he was he was told by the lower courts that he had to you know go back to Kentucky as a slave with his owner and in the Dred Scott decision in 1857 the US Supreme Court upheld that decision basically um, determining the slaves are property now the real story behind this is is quite a bit different as at least the real story as I have read it that uh, Dred Scott belonged to um, was a slave who belonged to a man in Missouri, as I recall, and as a part of his conditions of his will, if I remember correctly, uh, his owner freed him, you know, told him when he died he was a free man. But uh, Dred Scott w wanted to challenge the institution of slavery, and um, somehow or other, I believe his brother um, continued. Um, somehow conspired with him more or less to seem as though he was continuing to to enslave him and Dred Scott um, and his brother teamed up essentially to to uh, make it look so take it into court so that this would come before the Supreme Court uh, you know trying to free slaves read more about it <laughs> it's much more complicated than we're taught uh, but the bottom line is in this uh, on, on this particular issue is is the Dred Scott decision reinforced the notion that slaves were property that they did not have they did not have the rights that a human being has that a white person would have um, in in America they were not entitled to the same protections of the Constitution that white people were or free slaves for that matter free blacks in 1860, the census showed, however, that 600,000 children were identified as mixed race, that is, uh, primarily uh, white uh, plantation owners and their black slaves having children together. So, so despite the fact that uh, um, the institutions of our society were keeping slaves in their place, it seems as though the owners felt that they were um, worthy, of, um, worthy of sexual activity with Native Americans, this population, uh, were was forced from uh, their lands during this period of time, uh, uh, particularly during the Andrew Jackson or uh, administration, I believe, in the year 18, I'm thinking 30s, 1830s, perhaps. Um, and they were they were uh, very gradually forced from their lands, even though there were legal protections against that. And this was partly accelerated by the discovery of gold in California. By the Homestead Act, which uh, encouraged the settlement of the of uh, Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, get, essentially gave individuals free lands so the ability to go out and just stake their territory, even if Indians were already living there, so to speak. And the, the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, the Native Americans were viewed as uh, outsiders and viewed as being different, even though they were the original settlers in the on this continent. And it was all about progress and Christianization. This uh, this conquest of that of that population as as um, European Americans moved across the nation and uh, established their claims from uh, ocean to ocean. Here's a a map of uh, Southeast. Uh, United States uh, in the Indian removals that occurred during the uh, the Indian Removal Act actually of 1830 
uh, which was strongly supported throughout the South. And the dark green areas are uh, areas where Native Americans were removed uh, and the, the uh, light yellow areas were the areas they were sent to. They, there were um, lands that were inhabited by the uh, five civilized tribes of the East and, uh, and the states wanted to gain access and, and ownership to them because of their, um, I guess, the, the rich lands that were there and the potential for those lands. Um, and also in an effort to more or less, uh, you know, take over that particular country and, and, uh, and make sure ensure its continued control under, under the U.S. government. As I said, Andrew Jackson's administration um, was behind this. And in fact, uh, if I remember correctly, I've read that Jackson uh, in his later years uh, expressed a great deal of regret that he supported this. But um, um, the Trail of Tears, uh, which was the essentially the you know the the paths by which the the tribes were were resettled into the West. Um, by 1837, 25 million acres were open for white settlement in the southeast because of this. And, and largely the lands where they were uh, established, with apologies to those of you from Oklahoma and uh, and um, Kansas, you know, largely the, or Nebraska, I suppose it is, I don't know which is right above Oklahoma there, but uh, not particularly desirable lands. They weren't very fertile, um, and um, so they were really taken from lands with a lot of a uh, lot of promise and put on place and lands that no one else wanted, basically. And that's where their reservations were were established. Another group um, um, that uh, Phyllis Day looks at, and um, um, I don't have a slide on women here, and I'm not sure why that is, because perhaps uh, she didn't really spend a lot of time talking about women in this chapter. It's been a while since I've read this book, but uh, um, we'll be looking at, at the special interests of women uh, chapter by chapter as well. And just suffice to say, at this time, women were really kind of kept in their place, and uh, um, I know we'll be looking at um, women's issues as the certainly as the semester goes on. But uh, for labor, at least, uh, labor unions begin to, did begin to develop. Um, and they um, uh, began to back reform issues that include universal and free education. Public education did eventually get established in America. I think it was um, pretty late in this period, as I've not, if I'm mistaken. Um, children that were being removed from indigent parents were placed in apprenticeships and, and uh, uh, you know, really kind of forced into child labor. And uh, their, the labor unions were agitating against uh, decreasing or against abuse in those, inst in those organizations or institutions, looking for a shorter workday and generally improved working conditions. So uh, more about labor. And I think I think the issues about women for this period of time will come up in the second half of this of this uh, week's lecture. And so that's all for the first part. You want to take a break and get a cup of coffee and come back for the second part. I'll be here.